Hey, everybody. Welcome to the wrong end of the snake. Coming to you live from the Tater Audio Worldwide Headquarters in beautiful downtown Detroit. Welcome to Wrong End of the Snake, a webcast about audio, touring, and the relationships we have built between our road families that will be reunited soon. Tater and I have had an 18-year relationship on the wrong end of the snake with bands like Ted Nugent, Kid Rock, Slash, Stone Temple Pilots, Prophets of Rage, Iron Maiden, and most notably, 10 years with Linkin Park. My, co my co-host, Kevin Tater McCarthy, is a world-class monitor engineer with over 30 years in the business. You're old. I'm very proud to call him my friend and partner. He has eight Top Dog Monitor Engineer of the Year awards and two Parnelli Monitor Mixer of the Year awards. I'm Ken Van Jurten, a.k.a. Pooch. I am a front house engineer with three decades in the music industry. I am a three-time Grammy-nominated recording engineer. I have eight Top Dog Front House Engineer of the Year awards, and I am a winner of the Parnelli Front House Mixer of the Year award. Let's do a little bit of housekeeping. Please use the chat part of the Zoom app to communicate amongst yourselves and comment. I'll be trying to keep an eye on that. Uh, if you have any questions, please use the Q&A button at the bottom of the Zoom app and ask in that window. We will answer as many as possible during the hour. Please subscribe to our YouTube channel and our social media, Instagram and Facebook is at wrong end of the snake. Tater, why don't you introduce our guest? Today we have multi-instrumentalist and current drummer for Slash featuring Miles Kennedy and the Conspirators, bass guitarist and drummer for Canadian supergroup Took, a member of both Gene Simmons from Kiss's solo band and Bruce Kulik from Kiss and Grand Funk's current band. He's toured with Whitford St. Holmes featuring Brad Whitford from Aerosmith and Derek St. Holmes from Ted Nugent, performed as both drummer and bassist with the Guess Who, also worked with Alice Cooper, Don Felder from the Eagles, Montrose, Lemmy, Fergie, Adam Levine from Room 5, Vince Neil from Motley Crue, Jakey Lee from Ozzy Osbourne. Let's not forget Union, Sass Jordan, Theory of a Dead Man, A Kind of Like Crush, Street Heart, and Harlequin, if that's not enough. Here he is, ladies and gentlemen, Brent Fitz. Yay! We need Hi, guys. We need one of those applause buttons. You know what? I was nervous as we started. I'm good, but I was nervous. I felt like it was a, like a pre-show... <laughs> Uh oh. The restroom and when the build up, holy smoke. <laughs> My hands are sweating. How are you guys? These Doing these new great. uh these new normals are are uh it's I felt like I feel like we're doing a concert, you know what I mean? It's like, okay, <laughs> here we go. We're on stage, we're live. Yeah, uh it's a little bit crazy like trying to get all the things connected. Um and I know uh, but we made it work. I think, I hope everyone's watching us. <laughs> I hope it's working out there. Um, but Hey Brent, you know, um, we have a lot to get to and you know, we've been friends a long time and we're so grateful that you have come on, um, uh, with us. Um, but, uh, tell us a little bit about your humble beginnings, like how you got started and, and, uh, what was your first instrument that you played? Because I know you're, you know, you're, you're kind of known as a drummer, but you're like a keyboard player and a bass player and all kinds of things, right? Yeah, it starts probably with your parents deciding, oh, uh, we'll give you some piano lessons. But, you know, if you fast forward, you know, 40 years later, um, the piano lessons that I, that I hated as a five-year-old have probably been the most important, you know, start and the, the continued important um musical vocabulary of of uh you know like navigating a career in music so yeah i took piano lessons as a kid uh grew up in a little little city in canada and i was lucky enough that the piano lessons turned into drum lessons and because of probably the drum lessons that that gave me a chance to join a band you know when you're young and you're you're you know influenced by music by your you're listening to at home and, you know, records and then your friends and what everyone else was listening to. I'm, I grew up in the late seventies. I think we're all kind of similar in age and the bands that I loved kiss and Led Zeppelin and, and uh, Judas priest and iron maiden. Uh, those were all the bands I, I, you know, would get together with all my friends and we would jam in the basement. And, and one day you kind of, it gets a little better and a little more serious. And then, at some point it turns into like 
up playing a playing in front of people and gigs. And then, I mean, really, it just all kind of turns into you never think I'm going to make it a career. And I think you guys both are in the same boat. It's like sometimes being in the in the entertainment industry and music business in particular, the stumbling upon is a great happy accident because you do what you love as a kid. And then somehow it's kind of turned into like, wow, I, I love playing music with my friends, uh, you know, just in in my parents' basement. And lo and behold, one day you kind of find a way to turn that into a, a, a career. And um, so the humble beginnings are very important because I'm just glad my parents gave me some piano lessons because, you know, uh, both uh, Pooch and Tater and myself, we've been around the planet a couple times together. And... Um, and uh, you know that my piano lessons and, and some of my my secret weapon skills have kind of come in handy, right? <laughs> more than more than handy. Well, we're more gonna than, get into that in a bit. More than handy. Yeah, yeah more than. And handy. What, what do you consider your main instrument? Uh, my people skills. Ah, nice answer. <laughs> Aha, yes. Just happen to play good. music too. <laughs> Learn something new from you all the time. Now, can mm -hmm. we name the city from Canada you you grew up in? Well, it's on the wall. The Winnipeg oh, yeah. Jets. There you so, go. Uh, <laughs> yeah, you got to be from somewhere. So I'm, you know, from a small, smaller city, Winnipeg. But uh, I have called Los Angeles home for um, in the 90s. I was I had moved down there in the mid 90s. And then so I, I did almost a decade in L.A. And then I, I kind of moved to Vegas, actually, through a, a, one of the artists I was touring with. And then I've been there ever since. So I'm basically a, almost 20 years Las Vegas resident. Now, me me being growing up close to Canada my whole life, um, why don't you uh, describe to me a little bit about the uh, Canadian bands that maybe we don't, well, maybe in Detroit we knew, but maybe in the U.S. didn't know that really influenced you up there, especially when you, when you before you started playing out, when you were the big club bands up there, what was, what was one of your main ones you like to follow up there that maybe wasn't famous down here, but up there was, you know, the king of the, the club scene? So because Winnipeg is considered a very... Um, nurturing musical hotbed of, of for a small city and being in the middle of the country. Let me just say that uh, we all know on an international level, Neil Young uh, and the guess who as two big, you know, household name artists, but for everyone else that maybe doesn't know in the rest of the world, there were so many great bands that maybe were more regional. We had Streetheart, Harlequin, uh, Queen City Kids, Orphan, um, and then kind of a little bit off, uh, from, they were more from Saskatchewan, but, uh, remember the band kick axe, kick axe, kick axe. Yeah. So, but there was, there's, and there's a lot of, you know, solo artists and whatnot that have, you know, really done well coming from Winnipeg, but, um, my favorite band, and I even got to play with the band and the lead singer, Kenny Shields in the Kenny Shields band, uh, the, the singer from street heart, street that heart, was yeah. probably my favorite band growing up that was from, from Winnipeg. And um, so I just, I viewed them as, I thought they were as big as ACDC. I just didn't know that the rest of the world didn't know who, who Streetheart was, but a lot of cool bands. And I think Tater, you have experience touring Canada. I, I and have. Um, and I like to say a lot of the same places. Yeah. I'd like to say, let's not get uh, kick ax confused with kick Tracy. <laughs> Everybody Great listening band. Great band. We we both love Kick Tracy for That's a lot right. of reasons That's, through a yes. mutual friend. I, I want yes. to get Kick Tracy in there somewhere. So I have to <laughs> yeah, I mean, when I first started doing the club scene, we did these Canadian tours where we would play these. I don't know how to describe to the, to like the U.S. or maybe anywhere audience other than Canadians what those uh, clubs were called. They were probably had a certain name back then, but they were uh, they were a restaurant bar that bands played at during the night, six nights a week. Um, they had topless dancing during the day hours Correct. Um, for As the workmen to come in during the day. And they were also a, you call, I would say it's a hotel because the doors were inside. They weren't outside doors, but they were basically uh, hotels, um, uh, dancing with women and the rock club at night. And they were this combination of these three. And we toured all over Canada doing those. And uh, uh, it was the time of my life. And I know you played a lot of those places too. 
Yeah, recipe for disaster, right? <laughs> <laughs> you know what's funny what's... though is that you know most I think most Americans that maybe haven't experienced any of that don't realize like how passionate Canadians are about rock music. Like it's it's pretty crazy. All these bands that you listed, there's a lot of Americans that maybe have not heard of them, but any Canadian is always like, I know street art, yeah, hell yeah, you know. Um, well, we are. We're proud because we're the underdog. We're the you know the little the little neighbor. <laughs> thanks, but I thanks think, for guarding our forests. We we sure do appreciate it. But and you know, Tater, being from you know Detroit and so close to you know the border, how much uh, assimilation there is between the two countries. They're almost you know like a lot of. I'm sure Americans would go up to Windsor and vice oh, versa. Yeah. So I think for you, you probably got a good spread of Canadian bands exposure from the Toronto bands. Well, well, also, I'd like, I don't know if I'm, uh, this is the truth, but, you know, there's a very, uh, uh, this uprising of popularity of these cover bands now doing very well. And I always remember Windsor doing that back in the 80s. They always had cover bands that were very popular. Now it's gotten popular here, but it's been popular in Canada for a long time. Well, and just talking again about those clubs that we experienced where you had, I guess you could call it the cabaret with the cabaret. There we go six nights a week gigs and, you know, a hotel all in one. The great thing about that, that whole uh, setup was you could go and tour and get a lot of shows under your belt. So you did it. I did it. And going in, you know, in our younger years, figuring out all your mistakes in, in those days, you know, cause down the road, when it really, really matters, we all, I played a lot of bad notes and played a lot of bad gigs, but those were the most important times for, yep. you know, getting practicing the, your chops. Yeah. yeah. So the, Practic- I think that practicing scene your was chops for the big time. Yeah, man. Playing covers was really important. And I know Tater and I both had, Ken, where did you grow up again? Uh, I grew up in Northern California um, and ended up in too. Southern California. So, but uh, so, I grew up just in the East Bay. In Northern but there California. was, there was bands playing, of course, oh, where you were. San Francisco was like huge. Ah. Um, when I was a kid, man, it was like Racer X was playing at the, you know, uh, at the local club there in San Francisco. I forget the name of the club, but yeah, it was, wow. a, you know, I mean, it was a good metal scene, you know, it was happening. Yeah. yeah. And, and just, just to say like that era was kind of important because there was so much opportunity for live music and constantly six, seven nights a week. And, you know, fast forward to where we are now, let alone talking about how the industry is currently in the last couple of months, but in the last, say, 10 to 20 years, we're, I think we're very lucky to have had a lot of chances to play a lot of gigs back in those days, you know, in the, in, in our formative years. And uh, it's yeah. kind of paid off, I think, for us just having a lot of experience when we were younger. So what was your, what was the transition from that? What was your big gig? What was the first one that you, you were like, I made it. <laughs> well, playing with the, the local heroes that put records out, you know, I didn't play on the records, but to play those songs in front of people the, in the club days. And what was important was you got to play a lot. So in a set in a club, you, um, I recall three sets, you know, 45 hour sets. It's a lot of music. And, and, and when you do a, a concert with a, uh, a recording act, you're playing a one hour and a half show, you know, and it's like one night from city to city. So I thought, well, that's that you must have made it if you played one set <laughs> of original music and people came to see just you. And it wasn't the cover band that where they, you know, people were coming to pick up chicks or whatever. And uh, so that was a big deal. But after playing with that band, I felt very confident in a lot of things and just whatever other things I had experienced on a more next level professional being in a, in a touring band. And then I moved to LA, but you know, my restart kind of happened when I moved to LA, because if I had experienced maybe like, okay, now I'm with the big touring band in my hometown. As soon as I moved to LA, all bets are off. I'm back to zero. I'm like, who is this guy? Who's like, totally. I don't have any, you know, I couldn't drop names like, Oh, I, I toured with street Heart. People were looking at me like, well, Okay, cool. Canada <laughs> guy from Canada can play great, but you know, not until I got my first little breaks working with some other notables where it actually kind of started to work in my favor. But you know, I, I moved to LA and was fairly naive and ambitious. And the worst thing was I could come home with my tail between my legs. But yeah, I moved to LA, so that was a big that was a big deal. Now we have a gentleman named Peter Merluzzi that just asked a question, and I'm not <laughs> sure about Pete. 
but he says Canada never heard of it. Can you just give him a little explanation of where Canada is? So Mr. Um, Merluz, <laughs> the Mr. Merluzzi, he's going to know where that is. Pete, Pete should know north. better. He's had, he's had a lot of great experiences touring Canada, but we love Pete. He's one of our favorite touring guys and tour managers and whatnot. But uh, yeah, um, shout out to Pete. He's, uh, he's an amazing tour manager, accountant. Uh, yeah, he's doing great in the biz. He's, he's in our inner circle. Yeah. He he's honorary is. Canadian. <laughs> <laughs> he says he's currently out of work. Yeah, no kidding. We all are. Yeah. Uh, um, <laughs> I know. I know. Jeez. Um, so got it. You moved to LA. What was, uh, like your first, maybe American national touring act? I did get a great chance to play with Bruce Kulik from the band Kiss and John Karabi. We put a band together fairly quickly. I met both those guys, ironically in a studio situation where I remember John, uh, John and I met and, and I sat at a piano and played something and I go, Hey, I really like that song you did on this Motley Crue. It was like an EP called Quaternary. And John had played this John Lennon type track with piano on it. I remember I didn't really know him yet, but I, I sat down at the piano in the studio. And so I think, and even Bruce, the, they got, those guys thought of me as a piano player. I ended up working on some demos for them, but not without, like at first I was, kind of like jack of all trades guy and then at some point they were doing demos with drum machines and i said you know if you need me to play some drums and they were like oh you play drums so this has sort of always been my theme is like i'm generally oh i could you know switch at any time from different instruments and keep people guessing so my first gig was yeah playing with with those guys and and i grew up loving kiss i grew up loving motley Crue. so that was a important dot to connect with some guys that I knew their back story so well. And we sort of got along really well because I was the, the, the new guy in town. I was the Canadian and you know how it is. You got to sort of prove yourself and, you know, hopefully, and I'm glad that those guys gave me a chance and I'm, you know, forever thankful. So that was a very important, you know, joining of a band and we worked on original music and we put out re records and, and, uh, and got, got going, you know, fairly quickly. Awesome. And that was Union. You never mentioned the band, and that was Union. I'm sorry, yeah. Union. Union. Yeah. Union. Yeah. Yeah. And Jamie Hunting, our bass player, probably the most underrated, talented guy I've ever been on stage with. He had toured with David Lee Roth and Eddie Money, and and uh, had actually been playing with even Roger Daltrey most recently. But like those were some pretty good pedigree to jump in for for myself. You know, growing up in a smaller city in Canada. So, and I've just been building off it, and and uh, and relationships are everything to me. So I'm still very tight with those guys and still we work together on, you know, we sort of keep crossing paths on different things. So um, that was very important early on. Well, speaking of relationships, I like to maybe a little bit later get into, I mean, you have a great relationship with Todd Kearns. You guys always pretty much are together, but speaking of Todd uh, and touring, let's get into a story. And now we're speaking about multi-instrumentalists and stuff like that. <laughs> let's get into the famous story that you know, it's one of my favorite road stories to tell. I don't try not to tell road stories, but this is one of my favorites. I know it's one of Pooch's and <laughs> it happened in, I think it was St. Do we don't know if it was in Moscow, Russia I, first was the first yep, show. Moscow. Yeah. It's in Moscow. It's one of my favorite stories. And obviously you were the, 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 the crux of the whole story because it was, you know, the, the, the switching of the instruments that saved the, saved the shows. So uh, let's go into that a bit. Cause it's a great story. And, and I think people would love to hear it. And it just shows like uh, when you're on the road, you got to do whatever it takes to make it happen. And that's what you did as a musician. It was fantastic. And I'd like to interject a little later on, because my, my favorite thing about this story is when you were doing what you're doing, you did it in first nature instead of second nature and it, it guiding the guiding JD through it. And it was it, it, it I wasn't even mixing monitors that night. I was just standing behind the console just in awe. So go ahead and tell the story. Well, and just to back up, so we were all touring together on a, a Slash. That was our first, my first tour with you guys. Uh, yep. And my first tour was Slash. We started in 2010, right? As yep. the, you guys were our, we were all, the, you know, it was first together. That was Slash's first solo band yep. after Velvet Revolver. And um, so we had been out for, for quite, you know, several months. And I think so uh, we got to Russia and uh, it's just funny to think back like, well, this just didn't happen in Des Moines, Iowa. This happened in uh, Moscow. 
Yes. And there was, there's lots of, you know, inner in between things to talk about, but it was from a, an unfortunate situation that an ironic, uh, I, I mean, the, the point of the, um, our bass player, Todd Kearns, uh, was having a detached retina issue that was so serious that he had to be flown home immediately the day of our show, which was the morning of a, a sold out Moscow show. So, but uh, knowing what I know and I, and you guys probably, you know, we had toured together and you knew me as the drummer, but we were still getting to know each other. And I think my secret uh, little skills came out that day because nobody, nobody had really found out because and talk about Pete Merluzzi, who we were talking about. He was there and yes, he uh, was there. Pete had to let me know that uh, he was making sure Todd was getting immediately sent home uh, to Vegas to have surgery. And so yeah, it kind of looked at me because like because Russia is not the place that you want to fix your detached retina from. Just saying, no, we were like, and it's because him home the um, recovery, right? Yeah, the recovery takes 30 days and right. no flying. And um, right. so we would actually be stuck there. So just the fact that we were going to be, what are we going to do? Are we going to cancel a show? This is a really important lesson because at, at, at that stage in the morning, knowing that, that we're going to be without a bass player, generally that's, well, that the show is canceled, right? Totally. You know, when you're down a band guy, uh, unless... Unless, Unless. so <laughs> less <laughs> what happened now, let's just uh, quickly say that there, it's not really myself being the, it's a, it's a, it's two people that took this to, to really happen. And what was great was the morning of our, I remember Pete saying, um, well, Todd's already going to be on his way home. And um, so, you know, I, I need to talk to slash and I'm talking to you about it. And, and what are you, what are you thinking? And I said, well, I'm thinking, uh, we're going to do sound check and by, you know, 4 PM, we're going to have this, it's going to be smooth sailing. And, but Pete, I think had already known about my, my skills as multi-instrumentalist, but which was great. Cause he, that's why he was talking to me about it, but more important, and that's the great job of the tour manager is to make, you know, get it all happening. So kudos to Pete for, for, for rallying the troops. But I, here's the thing is I had to call slash that morning in the hotel and slash came to me and goes, Hey, so I, uh, Todd's going home and, um, and I basically go, yeah. And I, I'm, I got it covered. I know you have some interviews. I will um, see you at sound check at four and slash kind of said, well, I, I don't know what, what this means. And I go, well, um, JD is going to play drums. John Douglas, our drum tech is going to play drums for the show because, and slash knew that JD actually is a fantastic tech and we should talk a little more about JD after this. We should. Uh, John Douglas is amazing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, secret weapon. And so John Douglas is going to play drums. And so Slash is trying to, I, I'm sure going, well, okay, so JD's going to play drums. What, what about you? And I go, well, I'm playing bass. And Slash goes, but, but I don't know you play bass. <laughs> and I said, he didn't know either, by the way. <laughs> I was like, I know. I go, what and do I, you, I, Pete comes in and he goes, he goes, yeah, uh, it, we're all good. Um, you know, Brent's going to play bass and JD is going to play drums. And I knew JD could play drums, but I was like, yeah what Brett's going to play bass. That's weird. <laughs> yeah. So I just assured slash that I would see him at sound check and we would, we would be going, but he was like, I, I don't know you play bass. And I said, well, you know, hopefully you're going to find out. <laughs> and, uh, and I think what's important is when the chips are down and, or, you know, there's a, a, a moment of panic, like we said at the start of the show, you're like, Oh my God, you got to make it happen. If I thought about what was about to happen, I, you know, there might be a little um, hesitation of like, oh, this is this is probably ridiculous. But I just remember at the moment, the uh, the, the extra, you know, it just we kicked in as a team, like we're going to make this happen tonight. So I was more than happy to jump over to base and we quickly did a sound check. And I mean, the, here's the thing is for me as a multi instrumentalist, um, being able to switch instruments that day, you know, I hadn't played those songs. So we had a show to do and I had not actually performed those songs or rehearsed them, but something about those piano lessons and all my other musical, um, you know, stuff that I've sort of been harboring. It was like the day I took my piano lessons as a, as a five-year-old, I thought, well, this is the day where it all comes down to the most important and having those, that vocabulary. So yeah, we, so we did a great show that kind of, I, I mean, I, I guess, if you guys want to jump in and say it, it kind of went pretty good for oh, man, a, it that's went that's amazing. I was like, what is happening? How did this happen? I, I mean, literally my favorite, my, my favorite part of that was 
you not even concentrating really on the bass part as as much as you were trying to help JD get his stuff right on the drums. And it was like, how do you, it's, I thought you'd like have your head down buried playing the bass part. It was like second nature to you. It's like, it's just, the, it just blew me away. The weirdest thing for me was that that means that for the last, you know, whatever year that you were playing with Slash, you were concentrating on drums, but at the same time, you were like hearing what Todd was playing and you were able to put that all together in an afternoon. <laughs> like, dude, you're a genius. I don't, you know, it, it, it flipped me out. I've never seen anybody do that before. Yeah, that was, it was impressive. It was very impressive. I do love though that, you know, I have to give kudos to Todd because Todd has those skills too. And a lot of people do, you know, like there's guys that just, when you, when you can cover a couple instruments, I guess it just kind of shows that the guys that know how to play, you know, melody instruments and, you know, cause that's bass and guitar melody side of the stage. And then the, the percussion side, and then, you know, having singing skills and just, just all those little tricks. I mean, that's what, I, that's that people skills thing that I, I always, you know, really, I'm attracted to is guys who just kind of have surprising abilities and John Douglas, you know, as a drum tech, we have to talk about him because he had to that morning when he's setting up the drums. And I think I either called him or somehow got in touch with him. And I said, JD, um, Hey, uh, uh, you know, thanks for setting up the drums and uh, it's going to be a great show. And by the way, do you have, um, you got like a, uh, like a real good black shirt and a great pair of like stage shoes. And he was like, what are you talking about? You bring your dress. <laughs> dress yeah. So you're playing drums tonight. And I think if, I, if we had given him a chance to think about it too, he might've been like, no way. Nope. So the fact that you got to give JD credit for pulling off, because he was under pressure too, because he hadn't, you know, played in front of an audience. But uh, we could also fast forward to in the last several months, John Douglas has been the drummer filling in on Aerosmith. So <laughs> that's amazing. He, I hope he gets he a Triscuit it. endorsement now because, no you know, he loves those Triscuits. <laughs> yeah. It's, that's, it's, it's, <laughs> I know. it's amazing. That dude is uh, the most talented artist, like a uh, painter. Um, and he's, he he's like painted up a, a couple of year kits, right? Oh, yeah. I and, about that. Yeah. So, and of course, so many other great drummers, you know, he has painted and, and, and been drum tech for um, Van Hill and Alex Van Hill. And of course, Joey Kramer from Aerosmith, ZZ Top, so many where, great drum kits. Uh, where he also uh, filled in, I think he's been the only drummer ever to fill in for Frank Beard, right? Yep. I think that's true. Uh, yeah. So and not only that, he does, he like designs those kits, paints them, builds them. He, yeah. Yes. He's a fantastic talent. Yeah. So uh, he's kind of a pleasure to have on tour. And as you uh, and we should talk about a little bit about that, too, because when we first met and we were going to put that tour together with Slash, you know, I was just joining as a new guy. And my, jo you know, Slash is asking me to be in his band. And that's that's great enough for me. But then to put the whole tour together, that's where you guys were put into place. And then I met you guys sort of like first day and we were putting crew and, you know, like the back line together. And, and I remember, um, I, I guess I recommended JD. Let's, let's segue, gig. let's segue into that. Cause this is an important thing I want to bring it up and I don't want to say it wrong, but you have a keen sense, especially as a musician, um, to find the correct crew people. Um, and I just want to know when that started, when you thought about that, I've got to have the right guy and I've got to have the best guys out there. And instead of just taking whoever comes along or resume is thrown at you, that's something you keep in your, in your, uh, in your head, probably in your little filing cabinet in your head and say, Hey, you know, this guy's good. This guy's good. This guy wouldn't work for me, but you, you keep track of that and you know, those people and obviously that's why you had JD in there, but you've always had great drum techs, Lauren Wheaton, uh, I mean, James as of recently, right. Can't forget yeah, Mark, Mark Coons, Coons, John yeah. Douglas. I mean, those are all people at the top of their games. And you um, you always seem to get those people to work with you. And I just wonder, when, as a musician, do you think, I've got to have the right people with me and know who those right people are? I don't think most musicians even think about that. I definitely, at a young age, really 
spent the time as when I, my parents, my house, our basement was a social gathering for music. And I always welcomed my friends over to play. My parents were very cool with that. And I think just having, you know, good kids over and inspiring, you know, like I, I wanted to play with other kids that, you know, were into Kiss the way I was. And it's sort of built on that, I guess. And then, you know, I took group music lessons. I remember the first time I, the first, uh, this is my parents' story, but when I took piano lessons as a kid, we had this group organ thing. So it was like eight uh, kids playing organ. And okay. there was a report back to the teacher. They go, Brent, you know, he's, he's really got a lot of, uh, he's just a raw, natural musical kid. Um, and, and he, we, you know, we really think we're going to, um, you know, push him along, but he can't help but go around the room and help all the other kids. And if they're having any problems, he helps them and helps them play their parts. And they go, it's not a problem, but you know, the other kids have to figure out their stuff too. <laughs> I thought, <laughs> bad. but um, you know, having so much, uh, uh, I really value the, it's the power of the friendship and the referral and the Rolodex because, you know, the company we keep is just as important and having a great team and I'm, I'm into team, you know, I, I don't play music for myself. I, I love working with people. So over the years, finding the right uh, personality traits is really important. The skills that go along with the touring that we all do together with so many hours spent, you know, just you've kind of figure out what, what skills people have just by things they say. And of course, their, their abilities at, at their job. But man, I said it earlier, I'm in the people business. And some people are very introvert and some might not understand. Uh, and I've had people say to me, like, you know, too many people. And I could go to any city in the world now and probably connect with somebody. And, and then as far as a crew situation or a band guy, uh, it's happened more and more often where someone will call me and go, hey, you know, we need a guitar player. Who do you suggest? And I'll, I'll be like, well, it's either somebody I've toured with. I get up my phone and the Rolodex is, is already edited with like, I got, the, I got five guys that might be good for that or the one perfect guy. Because when, I, when we put the Slash when Slash put the, his band together back in 2010, you know, there was the, the start of the band when I first joined. And then when we ended up a couple years later, it was a, a little bit different situation. You know, Todd Kearns came in and, and I, I will say, I definitely recommended Todd and I knew he was the right guy for, you know, as a personality and, and musical ability. And Frank Sidoris as well had come in down the road and I think that those were important, you know, pieces of that puzzle to kind of make it make, you know, little hone it in a little bit. And so as far as crew guys, I'm only as good as, you know, the guy that's working with me, too. So I'm very lucky to have worked with you, gentlemen. You are the best. And, you know, it shows in all the gigs you've done. So hopefully when I'm not in the room and somebody is recommending, hey, call Fitz, it's because of something you did. You don't have any control of what people say when you're not in the room yeah, but when right. someone goes man i saw iron maiden on that last tour which i say and i've told you but i say to other people they sounded so good and you can't control you know your referral service until you're not in the room and that's so true yeah it's important and oh I've man that's that's amazing you know w one of the things as i as you were talking all i could think about was it's networking in general. Like you are, it's one of the things that I, I admire about you is like, you have the, your, your finger on the pulse of, <laughs> of what's happening, you know, not only in musician wise, um, but also like what Tater said and what you were just talking about with crew. And what I thought was, is fascinating is that um, you even know uh, crew guys that maybe uh, wouldn't be right for you. And so when someone like myself as a production manager comes to you and says, Hey, how about so-and-so you already know that that guy is wrong for you. And you say, no, nah, I don't think so, man. I heard from so-and-so that, so, I mean, I've never experienced another musician uh, besides Todd and the, and Shane, like all you guys, all you Canadian mafia guys, uh, uh, you know, you guys are like the king of networking. Like, where did that, where'd that come from? We come from small places and, 
you know, I wasn't lucky enough to be born in Los Angeles or even, or even in the States. So, you know, that path well-traveled, Todd and I being so close from, you know, provinces next to each other, um, not from the same cities, but yeah, we, we kind of always are looking at each other and thankful that we, we found a way to navigate out of the small city into the big, the big pond, the big world, the big music business. And I think we can't help but be humble and appreciative. And it was all about people and, you know, opportunities that, you know, through people, we were able to, to, you know, keep building off um, bands and, and career choices. So um, like Eric Singer is one of my very close friends. And even though I had, you know, for years before that, before I had met him, I had really, you know, chosen a lot of people that uh, I thought were, were good, you know, good energy to be around me in bands and, and whatnot. But I, I, I kind of found Eric had also been one of my, my good friends who looked out for me. So even though I'm looking out for other people and recommending, he's always been a, a real important friend because we're both drummers. We're both you know, we're not the, the name on the marquee, we're the, you know, the drummer in the band. And, but he's been really helpful as a friend because he is the most, um, you know, level-headed down to earth uh, guy in the business that is always looking out for other people as well. And I sort of, I always feel and, and appreciate having a friendship with someone who's, you know, I, I, maybe similar experiences to myself, but we still, you know, we kind of feed off each other a lot of ways. So, um, and Eric has recommended me for, for gigs many times. And, and, you know, I've filled in for him on Alice Cooper, but, um, there's no score keeping and there's no competition between drummers, you know, and, and, uh, but what's great is, and speaking of crew guys is of course the legendary Lauren Wheaton, who you mentioned Gump, yeah. isn't it great? Hey, I guess we need to all have our nicknames in place, yeah. <laughs> yeah, Tater and Fitzy, uh, and Gump who was uh, Neil Peart's drum tech for, for so many years, 25, 30 years. I mean, that alone gives you the, the idea of how respected he is. Um, but he, he had started with me on the last Slash tour in 2018. And as Eric being my best friend, and we talk all the time, he, they were gonna embark on, the, um, on their you know, recent last go around tour. And Eric was like, man, it's so great. you got Gump working for you. And, you know, in a roundabout weird way, um, I had said to Eric, well, I feel, you know, like you should be able to tour with Gump, you know, like he's, he's one of the most revered crew guys. And I basically said to Eric, you, you should, um, I think you deserve like to, to have Gump uh, out on your big tour. And I felt like weird because I was like, but, but I want to tour with Gump. <laughs> and, and then I think Gump was like, well, what do you mean? You, uh, like, you didn't want me to tour with you, but it was more like, I knew that our tour was only going to go so long and that, uh, the Kiss tour was going to be an extended several years. And, uh, so it kind of worked out that I recommended Gump over to Eric and the Kiss camp. And, uh, and he's been there ever since, but also the fact that touring with Slash and Slash still touring with Guns N' Roses, I had met Imee James who is another fantastic tech who was out with Guns N' Roses. And I kind of thought, well, if his schedule is similar to Slash's and mine, it might be okay that I, that Imi comes over to me on the Slash tour. And then in between tours, it keeps him busy. Cause you know how it is guys. Um, it's, it's almost harder for band guys to get in between gigs. Crew guys are a little more available to slip in between you know, a lot of touring things. And it's, it's sometimes actually harder for us, for us musicians to, to have, you know, four or five gigs on the go where you guys could actually, you know, have a couple. Anyway, so um, yeah, Imi came over to me and that kind of worked out good, our schedules. So I just looked at the big picture and I thought all of this is going to be better for all of us. And everybody was happy. <laughs> and uh, and that's, and so that's awesome. it. You're, you're like a crew trafficker. Yeah. <laughs> you're like, Making mid-season trades. Mid-season yeah, well, trades. Yeah, that's it. <laughs> it's the people business. But it's like looking at the whole picture, which is important. And that's fantastic. But that's amazing. I mean, you know, no, no other musician that I know would think you know, Hey, this amazing drum tech, like I want him, I'm not going to give him, you know, let someone else have him, but you actually looked and saw that the opportunity was a much longer opportunity. And you said, all right, you know, Eric, I appreciate you 
take him. Um, that's that says a lot about you, man. Can I ask when that conversation went down? What was the physical time that phone call lasted? The phone call, you mean for the length um, of the phone call? How long was it? <laughs> Talking to Eric Singer. How long was that? How long did that take? <laughs> Look, you should have Eric on your show. <laughs> if you guys get a word in edgewise, but I think Eric's a very valuable. Um, he's the voice of reason. He is me. the voice of reason. And um, and yeah, he's been really. Uh, it's funny. We we actually talked last night, and uh, about a lot of great things. And and he had said, you know, he was still very thankful that you know him and Gump got really close on the tour together, and um, and it's just all about finding like I just enjoy seeing people happy that, that they like what's great is you both are really close friends and you work well together and that's so more important than just you know having the ability to be the best at what you do right getting along and actually having true friendships is that's all i can hope for is guys that are just the best and have the great skills and the you know just the the, the sixth sense, how to, you know, the survival skills in this, it's a tough business, right? And then have friendships and, and uh, remember we were at NAM this year, because it seems like yep. ages ago, I was so excited to see you guys, you know, because it's, a, you know, it's like family. And then how about the, um, the great phone call of you guys were on a day off in Winnipeg with yes. Maiden this past year. And, uh, you text over to me saying, Hey, I'm in your hometown. What's there to do tonight on a day off? Yeah. <laughs> the best. What is that, there to do? I, I responded with, well, you better come see me play. Uh, Cause we're there. And you were like, what? And so, who is, who is, who is we there? So, uh, well, after the slash tour, we fired up and our band too, which you mentioned earlier, which is basically a, I guess a super group. Canadian super featuring, group. It is a yeah, with Todd, group. yeah, Todd Kearns and I from Slash's band, and Corey Churko, our uh, guitar player, is Shania Twain's everything. Musical director, guitar player, he's a multi instrumentalist. He's he's better than me. Always play with better musicians. Uh, and Shane Gallus, who is our drummer, and Pooch, you've worked with Shane. <laughs> and the, the world gets smaller. It's, it's, it's a small world, man. I mean, I, you know, when I was first coming up and moved to LA after college, he was dating this girl that was a friend of one of my roommates. And so like, I literally, I've known Shane for almost 30 years, probably. Um, and then, you know, you guys started playing together and he was, you know, doing great. He was, you know, in the bees and yeah. One of Michael my Schenker, Schenker, Ingvay Malmsteen. Yeah. yeah. Um, and, and we, I, we kind of stayed in touch, you know, but, but, um, you know, we, we talk to each other every once in a while, but when I heard he was playing with you guys, I was like, this is amazing. It's such a small world, man. It's unbelievable. And I knew Shane from those club days that Tater and I were mentioning all in the late eighties, we all had cover bands and long hair and we got our chops, you know, playing the Canadian cover band circuit. So he moved to LA. I moved to LA years later. I remember hearing like, Ooh, Shane Gallus moved to California. Like that was sort of all those things when someone left the scene and moved to LA, it was like they, they moved to Mars. Right. So I, I wasn't the first guy. I was farther down the list, but I was very inspired by that. So, and to fast forward, here we are at 50 years old now playing in one of our, in a band together that we just love. It's like playing with your, your high school buddies. You know, it's like, it comes full circle. So yeah, we were playing, we had a record release in Winnipeg. We were doing yeah. a show. Yeah. And you guys had the night off. So you guys got to come down. We hung out and um, and it was so great because we got to see each other uh, in Winnipeg. And, uh, you know, uh, interesting that night I had uh, a second detached retina surgery <laughs> and I remember I could only right. see out of one eye and uh, it was just a mess. But um, what is happening with you Canadians and detached retinas? Like, what, is this just you, Winnipeg? Uh, th is this a Winnipeg thing or all of Canada? It's genetic. <laughs> Everyone yeah. tr is trying to figure out, well, you and Todd play in the same band. Yeah. You're tall. You got black hair. Uh, you're head banging. You're Canadian. Yeah. What, what, what are the connections? I guess, I don't know. We just have bad eyes. So uh <laughs> I think you've just been banging your head too hard for so long. Now yeah. we've, we've had a question from Kate here and, and we're talking about Tuke and everything. She's asking, what's your favorite song to play from Tuke? Um, 
I love the song called My Girl by the band Chilliwack. Chilliwack, Chilliwack from, another Canadian. Named after yeah. a yeah, a, a town in, in British Columbia. The reason is I, I've, in all the bands I've been in in the last, say, 15 years, I've, I always like to sing. I always like to sing as I'm drumming or, you know, if I'm playing bass. But when we get to really sing four-part harmony stuff, that's when it's next level for me. So a couple tunes in the Took set, um, we do, you know, everyone in the band is singing and I, I love that. So uh, I'd say My Girl's a highlight for me. Right on. Awesome. And let's let's put it out there that you are the bass player for two, <laughs> not the keyboard player and not the drummer. He's the bass right. player in that band. What else do you yeah, play? Are you guessing. like a flute player and a sax <laughs> Is there anything, is anything else hidden? <laughs> yeah. What, what are your you know, other secrets? I got to, well, you know what my secret is? My sister is the better looking, more talented one in the family. So she's, I'm she's just a great the one keyboard that, player, right? She is. She's in the uh, one of the Michael Jackson shows in Vegas and plays with the, the guys in Blue Man Group and this really cool band they have called Tinnitus. So my sister and I are horribly, you know, we, we just like both became professional musicians and our parents probably never expected both of us to be uh, in the business. And, and she lives in Las Vegas as well. So, um, but my sister plays saxophone, you know, keys and, and sings. And uh, I never went to, it was always about like, what, what bands could you play Kiss songs with, you know? And growing up as a piano player, it was kind of hard to, f- to fit in, even though I love like Elton John, uh, you know, is one of my favorite artists. And, but uh, I don't know, I just find like, I think it's funny because people know me as a drummer, but I really enjoy the, the um, stepping out from, you know, my comfort zone and challenging. It's great to just, you know, not, your, your skills are always um, being tested. So when I, when I switch over to doing a tube gig, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm the bass player, but yet I'm, you know, and then I'm still drumming with Slash and all these other bands. So it's great. Got to play with, you know, lots of people got to, got to have lots of life experiences. So, so all... your parents must've played a big part in that musical education for both you and your sister. And I take it. She was at those lessons you were talking about earlier with you. And uh, that's fantastic. It's good to hear. Yeah. It's just great to have a, a younger sister, but you know, she made sure she made, she, followed her own path because she didn't want to be Brent Fitz's little sister. And I love dearly that I can go. I remember I was, I had a coffee a few months ago at some coffee shop in Vegas and the, the barista guy goes, Hey, uh, are you, are you Brenda Fitz's brother? And I was like, yeah, he was like, Oh, I love her band. She's got, you know, it's, I thought that's pretty cool. Guy does not give a shit about me. He's more interested in my sister's band. So awesome. Uh, that's awesome. Hey, you mentioned coffee because I know you're the go-to guy for uh, coffee around the world. Um, every time in any city, you always have the restaurant and the coffee place. You're always like, oh yeah, go here. Um, how, well, what, what's your favorite place? I mean, you know, guys, you get the blessing of being in multiple places around the world, not just once, twice, but you know, a handful of times. So you know, if you're lucky enough to go to London, England once, let alone every tour of the last, you know, 10, 20 years, that's a fantastic chance to go and enjoy your favorite foods, favorite clubs, or, you know, anything that you love. I, I just love that I don't, um, I'm kind of a simple guy and I figure coffee's good around the world. It's a good stimulant. It yes. doesn't, uh, leave you hungover. And, um, and so I've just adopted this, uh, but you know, I'm not the inventor of drinking coffee around the world. My, my guru and mentor is Derek Sharp, who wow. is in the Guess Who. And that whole band goes on excursions in the morning, jogs, a couple miles jog, and then they hit the, the coffee shop. And they actually tuned me in on, on uh, once I joined, and as a guest member of filling in on the Guess Who, uh, they Derek was next level for me. So I just kind of stepped it up and, and uh, you know, uh, have figured out that coffee is good for touring because it doesn't get you in trouble. <laughs> you don't miss bus calls. And, um, and how did you, um, you know, I mean, that that's interesting that you say that because how did you avoid the cliche rock band cliche of uh, traveling down, becoming an alcoholic and doing all kinds of drugs and whatever, you know, all I know lots of guys slash included who, uh, you know, went down that road is it, was it just something, you just weren't interested in or you tried it and were like later or, you know, 
Well, it's great to, if you use Slash as the, um, the gauge and maybe someone like Alice Cooper, now those are, those are legendary um, addicts. And those guys are the hardest working guys that I know that I've you know, shared time with on a stage uh, and personal, personal space. So I would say, I don't know what Slash was like before I met him in 2010. The stories were that, you know, he was a, you know, a, a drinker. I, I only know Slash, the, 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 the first guy up, last guy to bed and, you know, just very inspiring. Same with Alice Cooper. Those guys are probably the reason I'm like, well, I'm just glad they, you know, like our whole band was Slash. Nobody really drinks or I don't know. It just, it never becomes a thing where you purposely go, well, let's get a bunch of guys that don't drink. It just sort of things organically happen that, well, everyone's just kind of focused on making music and, and, and uh, it doesn't become a thing where it's, it's really talked about. And so I don't really have the answer. I don't drink. I definitely have done my share. I mean, I don't, I don't, even, Canadian. Know Slash, Come I don't on. even know Slash is a smoker, which seems weird. Yeah. First day I played with him. First thing Todd said too, he goes, Hey, something's different about, about Slash. And I, and Todd goes, yeah, there's no cigarette hanging out of his, yep. his mouth. So, you know, it's yeah. just uh, good for him. You got to survive. This is a crazy business guys, right? You know, we've oh, been, man. we've been warriors and we're gypsy pirates mm -hmm. and uh, you know, just touring like our wives or our significant others or our family members put up with a lot to have us out there being gone. And then, you know, it's expected that we come home and, you know, aren't completely wounded from the, from the tour. And, um, and, you know, how long have we been doing this? How long have you guys been on the road? Like long time, a long decades, time. over 30 so, years. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and it's, it's the rear view mirror is great to look back on, but I'm pretty happy with the 2020 where my head's at with all the other things. Cause I just long love time. the fact that we get to, you know, do what we love and play music and, there's been some drinking. There's been some partying. Not gonna lie, Tater. Those club days in Canada. <laughs> in Canada yes, right? that's because I I was legal to drink in Canada at that time. I wasn't legal to drink in the U.S. <laughs> yeah, we were like twenties. Come on. Yeah, it was I'm nineteen 50 years old. Legal. It was nineteen drinking age in Canada, and it was twenty one in the U.S. So I know. It made it even I better. I can't well, do that anymore. Speaking of the present 2020, like what's going on with you? You're continuing to write a bunch with Tuke and whatever, what else, what else is happening with you these days? Yeah, I'm excited. I'm waiting patiently. Like we all are, you know, uh, what is the next gig? Well, what's the next live gig? Nobody knows. Um, Tuke has been, we've done what, exactly what we're doing here on a zoom call. And this is a little bit, of the new normal, it's a little foreign, but I'm, I'm finding that if this is a way to be productive, then I'm all for it. So, you know, doing a lot of online stuff has been um, great. And I haven't, I, I'm actually in Canada right now. So I've been up here for a, about a month. So we, um, Tuke has a, like a COVID video we just did that's gonna come out. Um, we're gonna do it for Canada day and, um, so I, I, I would say in the next couple months, hopefully when I get back to Vegas, we can all get together in a room with a little bit of social distancing and, and try to be creative. And, and I think your tours and my tours, the big tours are all on hold, right? We know that maybe not until next year, we're going to see proper, proper touring, but it's a little depressing, but it's one or the other. Are you going to be negative about it or positive? I'm going to stay positive because, you know, that's all we can do is just is hope for uh, a finding a new way. You know, I hear about these drive-in concerts and, you know, on F Friday, I went to a show here in Winnipeg with social distancing at a club and I saw a band uh, like a, you know, horn band and everything. And I was so happy to see live music. It was great, but you know, baby steps for all of this stuff, but I'm trying to just keep my head up, keep busy. And, and how uh, did that and, work? Was it like, you know, everyone was standing six feet apart from each other. That's yeah. weird. Wow. Yeah. It was weird. A little odd. I, I, you know, the bands usually want everybody scrunched up against the barricade close to the stage. So, well, that's the, the yeah. energy part of that is yeah. what I think a lot of artists are worried about. Like we had Mike yeah. Shinoda on and he, you know, when we, t when we pointed that out, he kind of was like, yeah, maybe I'm going to wait until, uh, we can all scrunch back together. <laughs> hey, I want to say this on the air so I can nail you to it and um, mm. ha uh -oh. have a copy of it. Um, 
you will one day introduce me to my idol, Rudy Sarzo. Will you? Yes or no? I've promised that to you already. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's why I'm getting it on video. But now it's on video. <laughs> yeah. You know, uh, Rudy's really inspiring on that Hired Gun movie that Jason Yes, Hook, I've seen that. Yeah. Guitarist he Jason He just seems Hook, like who's... such a great person where he comes from and coming to the U.S. and his feelings and thoughts on that and his bass playing and all the bands he's been in. Love to meet him someday. And there's a reason, yes, all of those bands that Rudy has, you know, had in his in his um, in his resume are so um, important and and continues. Rudy is seventy years old ish. How old? I think Rudy's seventy, and um, so Looks I can only hope and be inspired that you know you get a chance to keep playing and and play in in relevant situations but yeah i love that you mentioned rudy because he's definitely an inspiring friend and mentor musician that i've known and been in in several bands and and i mentioned that movie and uh you know the the hired gun movie's great because a lot of the people that are in that movie as musicians i've already worked with most of them and the uh so the 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 premise is hired gun but i really think it's it's um people business, you know, it's the who's, the who's, who do you know, uh, business, not just being a, a hired gun, but uh, it's all about it's dot connecting. I, I had a friend that told me, he goes, Brent, you know how to connect the dots. So I guess I'll take that as a, a compliment. I think that pretty much sums it up for sure. Um, we're, we're about at the end here, but uh, we always like to ask our guests if there's a story about one of us in particular that you remember an interaction that happened between us, uh, maybe a funny anecdote that happened. Um, do you do you have any of those? Well, uh, I have a lot of photos of one of these guys that's in this Zoom meeting right now, and usually he's not awake. Uh, I can't sleep, <laughs> can't on, sleep planes. on planes. Tater can't sleep on planes at all. You know, it's I'm very jealous of that Tater because you know, as touring a 24 hour period of the day, if you can get in a quick little you know purr, a quick cat nap, it's it's a blessing. And Tater finds a way to put 10 minutes in, and it doesn't matter where it is. I work hard. <laughs> I got to get that little bit of sleep when I can. Yeah. So yeah. what I, I have is the coffee table book will be out soon. I'm sure. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. What I think is hilarious is that then he'll, he'll say adamantly, he's like, no, I, I can't sleep on planes. <laughs> Come on. <laughs> yes, oh, it's, a, man. it's a skill. It's it a, see, a you got skill. extra skills. I don't have any dirt on you guys, though. I'm never going <laughs> to sling the dirt. We've, we've had nothing but, you know, it's just been a pleasure to uh, to be friends with you, gents. And, um, oh, man, you too. We, we're, you are one of our favorite people. Um, we are pretty much in awe of your talent as a musician. And, um, uh, we really thank you for, for coming on and, and sharing your knowledge. And, um, you know, it's always a great time when we show up in Vegas and you're like, yeah, let's go out to dinner. You know, that's, that's always a, a great time. So, you know, you know what I, you know what I say too, is, um, all the bands I've worked for in the last almost 34 years coming up this August. You know, I have very, very, under a handful of guys that I actually call friends. When I say friends, I mean, I have their phone numbers. I have their addresses. Right. They'll see something and text me, blah, blah, blah. And, you know, and you're one of them. And there's only a few more. You know, Eric Singer is one of them. And, yeah. um, and there's not many more. So after all these years, to have these relationships like this, I, I, I really, I cherish them with, especially because you guys are so talented, just, uh, just to be around and soak some of that off and, and see you guys play. It's, 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 it's great to be on stage with you and just feel that energy. Well, yeah, we like the great. same food. So yeah. we're never going to have a problem finding a good restaurant in Vegas to hang out at. <laughs> and, uh, and Tater, you and I have a little um, love for fast cars. We do. Particular NHRA and one yep. team in particular. So, uh, and actually you were kind enough to connect dots for me. That's right. I connected a yes, few dots. Yes, you were. Very yeah. important. And, and we're um, going to, in the Q and a section, we're going to talk about this a hair more. We should. Yeah. Yeah. Well, thanks for coming, Brent. We really appreciate it. Um, you know, we'll do a little bit of Q and a later guys. Um, but, um, let's talk about next week, next week on wrong end of the snake is night. Bob. Bob is a legendary front of house engineer with over 50 years in the business. 
He has been a sound engineer or tour manager for hundreds of the biggest bands in the business. Kiss, Aerosmith, R.E.M., New York Dolls, Ted Nugent, Steely Dan, Michael Monroe, and many, many others. He's a legend. Tune in next week at Tuesday at 2 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Thanks a lot for coming, guys. We sure do appreciate it. One more time, thank you, Brent. You're the best. And 